Within your bulletin, there's a number of announcements that I want to talk about uh, as quickly as I can. Uh, first of all, we've got a copy of the uh, COVID protocols. We'd ask that y'all just uh, uh, observe those. And it looks like everybody's doing well. If you don't want to wear a mask, you can sit in the first two rows. Otherwise, please wear a mask when you're in the sanctuary. There's a number of visitors. Now, this visitor card is not in your bulletin, but there should be one right in front of you. If you would like to complete that and drop it in the collection plate, which is at the back, uh, on your way out, that would be appreciated, so we know you're here. And if you are new to the Baptist Church and you're curious about what it is that we believe, in front of you should be the Baptist Faith and Message, and you're welcome to take that with you, and you can read through that, and it is the uh, Statement of Faith for the Southern Baptist Convention, which we're a part of. Speaking of the Southern Baptist Convention, the reason the Southern Baptist Convention exists is for missions. And we support two missions uh, each year. At Easter time, we do what's called the Annie Armstrong uh, North American Missions uh, Offering. So if uh, you'd like to give to the missions to North America, you can fill out the envelope and drop it in the plate on the way out as well. At Christmas time, we do what's called Body Moon, and that is for international missions. There is a uh, notice about the Easter lilies for the folks who purchased lilies and who they are in memory of or in honor of. There is a notes page about the sermon today. Just hang on to that for the sermon. You can read along and, uh, and get that. What else? Uh, inside on your bulletin, Easter service at Williams Place. So for those of you who aren't aware, every uh, third Wednesday, every third Wednesday, every third Sunday, we go up to Williams Place in Davidson to uh, bring the gospel to those residents there. It's Easter Sunday, and so uh, we actually started at Williams Place four years ago today on Easter Sunday. And uh, if anyone would like to come with me uh, and join me up at Williams Place today at two o'clock, uh, that would be appreciated as we bring the, the uh, gospel to the folks there. We meet on the back patio, we meet outside, and I'll have to go inside the building. Discuss Annie Armstrong, Children's Committee meeting, uh, attention parents and grandparents 
There will be a meeting of the children's committee on Thursday, April 8th at 7 p.m. in the Belgian Hall. All parents, grandparents, and anyone interested in working with our children are invited to attend. This meeting is to obtain family input and discuss safety measures for restarting children's church activities beginning on Sunday, April 18th. And then please contact Denise Lewis uh, with any questions, or you can run that to the church office as well. Finally, I think, is the blossoming of the cross. If you're unfamiliar with that uh, tradition we have here, after the first song, we're going to decorate the cross here, the old rugged cross, and make it into a beautiful thing with the flowers. Uh, what I'll do is I'll ask the rows to come up. We'll probably start with the front rows first, uh, so we can make it our distancing. Take up a number of flowers. We've got lots of flowers here. And then you just stick them on in. And uh, then return to your seat, we'll call the next row up, and what you'll see is the transformation of the cross into something very beautiful. So uh, if you work here with flowers, that's great. If not, we have mounds and tons of flowers here. Uh, so please uh, take as many as you need. Other than that, yes, sir. Okay, we'll do the... No, 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 I'm glad you keep me on my toes, okay? Uh, so before we get to that, just the last thing is Wednesdays, our primary study day at 7 o'clock in the morning. There's a men's breakfast. All men are invited uh, in the fellowship hall. It's BYOB, straight home breakfast. And then at 2 o'clock, we have a Bible study and that's on Zoom and it's also in person. The Zoom information is on the back of the bulletin. And then at 6 30, we have another Bible study and it's in the fellowship hall in person or by Zoom uh, again. So uh, a lot going on. And then at 7 30, we have choir practice. Can't forget the choir practice. So busy day on Wednesday. Any other announcements apart from the video uh, that we need to make before we begin? Seeing none, are uh, you queued up? Do you want to set an intro for this, Diana? I will. Okay, let's just see it. <laughs> <laughs> Galilee. There you will see him. 
Let's stand as we sing our first hymn of the day. It's called Jesus, excuse me, it's called Christ the Lord is Risen today. It's hymn number 367 in your hymn books, where the words will be on the screen. 367.
Uh, we always pray for our church, not only our church, but also the other two churches that meet here. Uh, we'll be meeting Lacey Christiana, and that's the four, a Hispanic church. And then later this afternoon, we'll be at Kitchen Baptist Church. They're from Myanmar. And uh, if you've been reading the news about Myanmar, you know there was a military coup a couple of months ago, and those people are being terribly persecuted. Uh, so please uh, continue to pray for the people of Myanmar. They're on the list each week. Uh, not just our churches, but the church worldwide and all the churches, persecuted Christians, our government, our country, the military, uh, first responders. Lori Compton is here, so she's uh, got a second job in the she told me. So third, praise God, we get to that job. Um, Luke Gavin had surgery, I think. Is that correct, uh, David? Uh, he's going to have surgery on the two-year flight. Okay, so we should look at Gavin. Uh, Christopher Harris had sepsis in the bones. Does anybody have an update on that? I see it. Uh, Myra Hall had breast cancer. Johnny Reed, uh, cancer testing and travels. Carol Roy uh, is suffering from intense pain. The people of Alabama with the uh, storms. And of course, the people of Myanmar are on the list uh, as well. Any any other prayer or praise? And I have a little bit of praise before we get started. Uh, just praise the uh, the weekend we had with the children. Thank you in particular, uh, Diana, for the work you did. And Beth was uh, working on that too. Um, had a great time in the video. Really should. So praise God for, for getting kids back into the church. All right. Uh, so. I was going to see if you could address Nate Cole. Yeah. He's uh, a junior called Alabama and he's on the list as well. Yeah. And I think he's starting to Okay. Yes, Nicole is a tumor and then the laser treatments to develop his skin. Her cancer has returned. Her cancer has returned. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, Jeff Kittle keeps up in the virus and he has uh, serious, serious cancer. And so it's the whole Kittle family. The whole Kittle family. Okay, Jeff Kittle has cancer. The whole Kittle family. Mm -hmm. Who's this? Oh, oh sorry. Charlie Mercy for the Browns and stuff. And all the people that are traveling with Mr. Brown for his whole week. And uh, everybody that's traveling. Traveling mercies for the Browns and everyone else who's traveling for the holiday. Doc, let's see your hand. A, a praise for everybody that can be here tonight and Amen. prayers that you will be back, all of us. Amen. 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 So, so praise for the folks who were able to make it today and uh, the prayers that we've all put together. I think I counted 45 or so people to us. That's more than 40. There you go. Okay. Any else go to prayer requests? Let's just take this all to the Lord first. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with praise and thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for raising your son Jesus from the dead. That is the reason we are here. The whole Christian faith slides on one historical event, the resurrection of Christ. Apart from Christ's resurrection, there is no Christianity. There's no hope because we're all so caught in our sins. So, Father, we praise you for the work you did. We praise the Savior. Our Lord Jesus Christ for sacrificing himself on our behalf that our sins might be taken away and we might rise again someday if we just put our faith and trust in him. I praise the Holy Spirit who comes and pours out upon the people and softens hearts and hearts and turns them in repentance and faith to the Savior. Lord God, we have so much to be thankful for. We lift it all up. We lift up all the churches Especially those that meet here in Cornelius and in this state and across the world, Lord, praising your name and the resurrection. Father, we thank you for all the names that have been listed today. We pray that you would have your will with them. That they would accept whatever will it is. Because you have in mind what's best for each and every one of us. And so we look to you in confidence. Lord God, I just want to thank you again. There's no greater privilege for me to be able to preach the word. I pray others out there feel this word, that they would have the gospel ever on their lips, and that they would share it in this sin-sick world. Because, Lord God, if we look at the world, we see its need. So, Lord God, Father, the only peace, the only prosperity, the only hope of this world is you. In the great name of Jesus Christ, our one and only Savior, in which we pray. Amen. Amen.
Now we no longer pass the plate uh, during COVID, but the collection plate sits in the back on the table. If you'd like to leave your tithe and offering on the way out, you're welcome to do so. If you're home and watching us on Facebook Live, if you'd like to continue to support the ministry of the church, you're welcome to uh, mail in your tithe and offering to First Baptist Church of Cornelius, PO Box 100, Cornelius, North Carolina, 20031. Or you can go to the website and you can use the donate button to pay electronically. Either way, thank you so much for your generosity in the support of this church. The book of Revelation, the Bible says, I am the living one. I was dead. Behold, I am alive forever and ever. Let's stand as we see hymn number 368. It's called He Lives. The words will be on the screen. So use your book. Hymn 368. <laughs> Oh, 
Phillips and Peters. The name of the church is Travis Bay. He introduced North Carolina. All the works that have been done here, Lord, in your name. The souls that have been touched. The souls that have been saved. Your church here, called First Baptist Church of Grenadas. These are your buildings, your doors, your camps, Lord. Help us to always keep it a holy place for you. We do thank you for the tithes and all these that have come into your church all around the world today. We pray that you'll undergird them, Lord, that you'll multiply them like you did the fish and the loaves. Multiply them for your work, your good works, your holy works here on earth. That many more people will be saved, that many more people will come to a knowing, knowing knowledge of you and your love. Just forgive us for our many sins and shortcomings. Help us, Lord, to be a lot more like Jesus and a lot less like ourselves. Every day. Listen to the beautiful, powerful, holy name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer, we pray. Amen.
hearts and minds to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, today. Our scripture reading for today is from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first letter, chapter 15, verses 12 through 22. If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. And again, this is 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, beginning at verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say, there is no resurrection of the dead. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God, because we have testified wrongly about God, that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead are not raised. And if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Join me in prayer for you before the sermon. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your holy word, the proclamation of the gospel, and the willing ears and hearts and minds to hear it. Lord God, Father, pour your Holy Spirit upon this assembly that I might be empowered to preach this well and to your pleasure, and that your spirit might work in the hearts of the folks here, that they might hear and believe and be turned to you. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm excited to be here this morning. I mean, not only just because it's Easter Sunday, but it's nice to see a lot of folks in church again, uh, particularly concerning, uh, considering what a year ago we were totally closed up. Uh, we had to do this over the internet. And uh, so now, praise God that we're back in church and have this uh, uh, almost behind us. And, you know, today is a day we saw the, the, the video with the kids doing the Easter egg hunt and coloring eggs and, and the lilies and the blossoming of the cross. The, the day is filled with symbols, uh, beautiful things. I, this morning, got this huge, solid chocolate rabbit. This is going to be two pounds, right? So I must have been a good boy this year. So I, mean, I think the Easter Bunny is just like Santa, you got to be good to get stuff. But uh, anyway, so yeah, I'm, 
I enjoy all of these little things that we do, these little traditions. I know some people get upset about them or concerned, like, oh, you know, do they have pagan roots or do they distract us? You know, I think it's all fun and games. It's all okay, so long as we always come back to what is this day all about. And I'll tell you, it's all about the resurrection. We see that in the scripture reading today. It's important because the resurrection of Jesus is what Christianity is all about. Right, when we have baptismal candidates come forward, folks want to be baptized into the church, we ask them one, well, really it's two questions, one, one verse from Romans 10, 9. Do you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and do you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Right? It is, it is the most important thing, the resurrection, because without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. And Paul goes on to say, if you believe these things, you will be saved. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of all Christian belief. If there's no resurrection, there's no Christianity. But hear me when I say that. If there's no resurrection, there's no Christianity. Therefore, we must accept the resurrection of Jesus Christ as true if we are to be saved and have fruitful ministry in his name. So with that, I'm going to take us to our reading today and give you a little bit of context as to where we are. This is chapter 15 in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. He has 16 chapters, so we're nearing the end of this letter. Paul has addressed many issues and concerns and problems and questions in the Corinthian church. But now as he comes to the close, he is going to talk about what is most important. And he even says that in verse 3 of chapter 15, For I pass on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And that's the key to this whole celebration we have today, the resurrection of Christ. And he addresses it here because there's a problem, again, in the Corinthian church. And that problem is some of the folks apparently deny the resurrection. And so Paul is going to address this and talk about those who are denying the resurrection, the consequences for those who deny the resurrection, <coughs> and then he's going to come back and proclaim the gospel yet once again. So let's come to verse 12 where this reading today starts. And he says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, well, he is. That's Paul's entire proclamation, or it might be translated as preached in your, in your version. If Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So apparently some of the folks are denying that the dead are resurrected, and by logical conclusion, if the dead aren't raised, then neither has been Christ. And there's going to be a consequence to that bad theology. And Paul's going to get to it. But before we get to the consequence, let's look at who are the folks who are denying that there is a resurrection. Now, he doesn't say explicitly. So the first thing we want to look at is, right, so who is this audience? Well, it's the Corinthian church, right? This is the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. The Corinthian church is in Greece. And if we go back to Acts chapter 18, we read where Paul established the Corinthian church. And we read there that the Corinthian church is made up of both Jews and Greeks. There's a blend of folks within the church. So let's take a look at both groups. The Jews. Why might some of the Jews deny the resurrection? Well, if we look into the scripture, we remember there's two primary groups within Judaism at the time. The Sadducees and the Pharisees. You may remember that. The Sadducees had different theology than the Pharisees. The Sadducees only accepted the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch that it was called, as holy scripture. The rest they did not. The Pharisees accepted all of the Old Testament as inspired scripture. The Sadducees denied the resurrection. On Judgment Day, they said there is no resurrection. The 
The Pharisees, of course, said they're wrong. So it could be that these Jews within the Corinthian church are influenced by the Sadducees' theology. We don't know that for a fact, but it's a logical conclusion. So what about the Greeks? Why might they deny the resurrection? Well, if we look at Greek mythology, there's a lot of resurrection stories. And so the Greeks, by this time, in the first century, have pretty much moved beyond their mythology. They still understand the mythology, but they see it as mythology. The philosophers and the wise people of the time have done away with mythology as fables. They see it as good stories that tell, tell us something important, but they deny that it actually really happened. And so consequently, some of the Greeks may say, well, maybe this resurrection of Jesus is just another myth. It's just something that was made up in order to, like a parable, to give us a, a message, but really it didn't happen. We also might think that they're questioning it. As we go further into the letter, verse 35, Paul writes, Some will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they have when they come? Now this might be the root of the problem. They just may not understand what happens during the resurrection. Right? Someone dies, they're buried, they're in the ground for some years, they begin to decompose, right? And then there's the resurrection of the dead. Well, what kind of body do they come out with? It's just like, you know, the walking dead or the dawn of the dead, you know, these zombie-looking things that come out, or you know, what kind of body do people have? So there may have been some sort of question about exactly what does happen. We don't know what it was, but what we do know for certain is there are some who are denying the resurrection for whatever reason it was, and that's a giant problem. That same problem persists today. And it's not really as bad as I had originally thought. When I did some research and looked at different polls, the Harris Poll, Lifeway Research, they both come up with the same number. About 20% of Americans deny the resurrection. That's one in five. Now, I didn't think that was a very big number. 20%, I would have heard it was more than that. Now, if you go to Europe, it's like 75%. But here in America, it's still that 20% deny the resurrection. We don't know, they didn't answer the question, if it's a myth, if it's a story, or it doesn't happen, or an atheist, whatever the reason is, but 20% of people in America deny the resurrection. 14% are unsure. They don't know. They just have no idea. That leaves two-thirds of Americans who believe in the resurrection. That's a big number, 66%. And if you break that number down into the different denominations, for evangelicals, which is what we are at Baptist. Baptists are considered evangelicals. We believe in the good news. That word evangelical, just in case you don't know, comes from the Greek word euangelion. Right? Euangelion is a compound word in Greek, you meaning good, and angelion meaning the message or news. It's the good news. And evangelicals preach the good news. We believe the scripture. We believe that salvation is through Christ and Him alone. And so it makes sense that 97% of evangelicals believe in the resurrection. That's good. That's good. When it comes to Roman Catholics and mainline Protestants, the number dropped. It's about 86 to 87% of Roman Catholics and mainline Protestants. Mainline Protestants are your Methodists, your Presbyterians, your Lutherans, and so on. They're considered mainline. They dropped to a little more than 10% who don't believe. And so then that begs a question to me as a pastor. Even for the three percent of evangelicals, all right, out of, out of the room today, we've got about 45, 50 people. That means maybe one and a half people, if you call yourself an evangelical, doesn't believe the resurrection. If we were in a Protestant or mainline Protestant or Catholic church, somewhere around you know 10, 12, 15 percent of you would not believe the resurrection. That's a lot. You know, one in eight people. And so then I would ask, you know, why are you here? What, 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 what is it that brought you in? Because if, if it's not celebration of a risen Lord, you know, Christ who lives eternally in his body, if we're just here for the lilies and the beautiful songs and things like that, those are fleeting. They'll be gone tomorrow. These flowers will wither and die. Christ reigns eternally. And so, the first question I want to ask you all to consider within your heart is do you believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead as given in the Bible? Because if you do, you've got hope for salvation eternally in him. 
If you don't, there's consequences to that denial. And Paul goes on now to explain those consequences. And there's really two. He goes on in verse 14 and he says, If Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation, or our preaching, it also can be translated as, our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. The consequence of denying the resurrection has twofold problems. One, it makes the proclamation of the gospel in vain, and it makes faith in vain. What does that mean? So let's take the proclamation of the gospel, right? If it's in vain, that means it's futile, it's useless. If I am up here preaching the gospel, and what's essential to the gospel? That Christ died for your sins and rose again on the third day, so that we might rise with him. Uh -huh. The root is in the next life. The root is the resurrection. 
You can't have good fruit if you don't have the root. I can feed, I can clothe, I can house a million people. If the resurrection is untrue, we all end up in hell. That is the consequence of no resurrection. And that's the problem with liberal Christianity and those who reduce Jesus to just a good moral teacher. There's no salvation in that theology. There's no salvation without the death and the resurrection. Jesus says in Matthew 7, beginning in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. These folks have fooled themselves. We've done all these wonderful things in your name, Lord. We cast out demons. We did many wonders. We, we prophesied. And Jesus calls those works lawlessness. Why? Because works do not save you. Works as a method of being saved is lawlessness, is sinfulness. You're saved by grace through faith in Christ, the repentant faith, and that alone. The works come afterward. Right? The works are a joyful response for what Christ has done for you, but don't reverse it. The root is necessary for the fruit. The fruit is essential. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we don't do these things. But these things are not the means of salvation. The resurrection of Christ is the means of salvation. He says, those who do the will of my Father. Now, what is the will of the Father? If you go to John 6, 40, my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up on the last day. The will of the Father is to believe in the Son. That is what it's all about. So I want you to see the consequence of denying the resurrection. Both for the proclamation of the gospel, it makes it false, and for the, the eternal state of your sin, your faith becomes, the eternal state of your soul, you, the faith becomes useless if there's no resurrection, because there's no hope. And so Paul does what Paul does best. He brings it all back to the proclamation of the gospel. You get to verse 20, and he says, But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead. There is no doubt about it. And therefore, all those consequences we've just heard about can be dismissed. He proclaims the truth that Christ is, in fact, risen. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, they have, yes, in fact, gone on to heaven because of their faith in Christ and their belief in the resurrection. And Jesus is called the first fruits. He's the offering. He's the sacrifice on their behalf that they might rise into heaven. Paul gets on to the problem of sin and death in verse 21. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. To clarify that, he goes on in verse 22. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. The man Adam, the first man, the historical real person who was created by God, the first person, sinned against God, and with his sin, death entered the world. Sin and death reigned from that point forward, and Paul is introducing this idea of original sin, that we have inherited the sin of Adam. Right? It's in our DNA. Right? You were conceived in sin, you were born in sin, you live in sin, there's no hope for you apart from Christ. Because we all died in Adam. But another man came, Jesus Christ, fully man and fully God. He had to be man so that he could die on our behalf. He takes our sin upon himself 
And he takes the punishment that we deserve for our sin. We should hang on the cross. But he goes there in our place. It's called the substitutionary atonement. He takes the punishment for us. He is our substitute. He dies for our sins. We don't. And then, as God, he is raised from the dead by the Father. He is raised again to everlasting life. His sacrifice, because he is fully God, is large enough, extreme enough, big enough for all the world. So he is fully man, and he is fully God. And through this man, Christ, we can be made alive for those who are in Christ, those who believe. And after pointing out the consequences of denying the resurrection, Paul just gets back to the gospel message. And he knows that some of the people reading this letter, hearing this letter read aloud in the church, are going to still deny or believe. Early in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the first chapter, verse 18, he writes, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. He knows that some folks will hear that preaching. I know some folks will hear my preaching today. And they will say that's foolishness. The Jews ask for signs. The Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Paul knows there are those who have hardened their hearts and will refuse to believe even the logical consequence of denying the resurrection. And that's why the scripture says, if today you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And so that leads us to what we should do as believers. How do we address issues of unbelief, denial of the truth of scripture? Well, first we address them logically and through reason using the scriptures just as Paul did, because the scripture is the basis of all truth. And then once we have proclaimed that truth, we give them the gospel one more time. Maybe this is the time it will stick. Maybe this is the time the Holy Spirit will soften the heart so that that person turns in repentance and faith. Because even though we may proclaim the gospel, and it could be eloquently, or we might stumble. It's the Holy Spirit that changes the heart. And so we preach the word, and we wait for the Spirit to do the work. So if you call yourself a Christian, let me give you a few points as a call to action. First, you must believe the resurrection. Apart from the resurrection, there is no Christianity. As I said earlier, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Or in other words, if you don't, you will not be. Belief in the resurrection is required for salvation. If you deny the resurrection of Christ, then understand the consequences. Our preaching is useless. Everything I do, every Sunday, all week long, I'm wasting my time. If Christ has not been raised, we are all hopeless, and I am just fooling you and lying to you on a daily basis. And you, your faith is useless, and you're still in your sins. And all of us are on our way to hell. But if you believe the resurrection, you need to do what Paul does. Preach that gospel. Peter writes in 1 Peter 3.15, Be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for your hope with gentleness and respect. Don't miss that last part. Gentleness and respect. And once you have given the reason for your hope, then leave it in the hands of the Holy Spirit. Pray for that person that they might turn and have eternal life in the name of Christ, whose resurrection we celebrate today. Amen. Amen. And that's why we do the altar call. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our tradition, at the end of every service, we have what we call the invitation, or some call it the altar call. It is that last opportunity 
for someone to make that decision to turn to Christ today. And so in a moment, Terry's going to get up here and lead us an invitational hymn. I'm going to stand down here. And if anyone here today has had their heart moved by the Holy Spirit to give their life to Christ, to turn from their sin and turn to the Savior in repentance and faith, this is the time. As I said, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, but instead turn to Christ. This is the opportunity. Walk out of here knowing that you have eternal life in his name. And it takes no work on your part. It only takes trust, faith, belief in Christ. So as Terry leads us, I'll be down here. If you want to give your life to Christ today, come forward and let me know. If you're a believer and you have something you want to share with me and pray over, come forward as well. If you do that, and if you want to become a member of this church, come forward and make that known. But first and foremost, the altar calls for those who would give their life to Christ today.
ask that the back rows exit first, Chief, you kind of do a little traffic uh, talk for me. Thanks. And um, Lois, you've got your, your helper to sanitize. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'm going to close us with the simple gospel message because I want you all to hear it. I want you all to know it. It's very simple. You were created to be in a relationship with God. You broke that relationship through your sin. And there's nothing that you can do on your own to correct it. And that's why Christ came, to live the life that we should have lived, to die the death we deserve to die, and then rise again, so that we just put our hope in him. We will have eternal life in his name. That's the simple gospel. Go out and share it. For the glory of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.